content and material discussed in these podcasts are for informational purposes only and are not intended to be a substitute for your professional veterinarian's advice, diagnosis, or treatments. Always seek the assistance of your own veterinarian with any questions you may have regarding the medical condition of your pet. Um, excuse me, are you in the know? This is a Noman.co production. I'm Dr. Gary Clemens, and this is Talking Pets Podcast, Fleas and Ticks. But first, I'd like to say thank you for the positive feedback I've received from listeners. It's been quite an experience switching from radio to podcast, but it's great to be back in the saddle again. The medium may have changed, but some things still feel familiar, and I'm so happy to be able to share my experiences again with you, my listeners, through this podcast. And again, thank you for joining me. For today's episode, I'll be sharing with you how to prevent and what to do if your dog or cat gets fleas and ticks. Really, it's not if, but when it happens to the best of us. But before I get started, I wanted to talk to you about something that's been bugging me for a long time, and it's not fleas and ticks. My wife Donna and I have two dogs. They're named Annie and Archie. Annie is a four-year-old mixed breed dog, about 16 pounds, and Archie is a four-year-old beagle mix, and he's about 26 pounds. They're both rescue dogs. My wife and I walk them three times a day, and when we go on walks, we have to stop every five minutes to let the dogs pee where other dogs have peed, so it takes a long time to go for a walk. While I'm watching them mark their territory, I notice that occasionally I find large piles of dog poop on the ground, and to me that's very frustrating. Off in the distance, I often see a gentleman walking two very large dogs, and I've never seen him walking with a poop bag. Now, I always carry a poop bag with me, and probably on two of the walks during the day, my dogs poop, so I get the poop bag out and pick up their poop. The poop bag is not always out, so maybe when I see this man walking his dogs, maybe his dogs just haven't gone yet, but I kind of doubt it. But I've seen him often enough that I have a feeling he is the one who's leaving the poop in the grass or on the sidewalks. One of our neighbors was very frustrated about dog poop being left in her yard that she actually purchased and put up a dispenser on one of the poles by her house that contained dog waste bags. On it was a sign that said, please pick up after your pets. One day I was walking down the sidewalks by her house and right next to the poop dispenser on the sidewalk was a very large pile of dog poop. And this really annoyed me to no end that somebody was that irresponsible. All they had to do was reach up, grab a poop bag, and pick up the poop from their pet. So if you want to be a good neighbor, I recommend you take a poop bag with you and always clean up after your pet. Because not all neighbors like dogs. And if your dog continually poops in somebody else's yard, that's really not a good thing for anyone. So be a responsible pet neighbor and pick up after your dog. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks again for joining me for today's episode. I will be sharing with you information about fleas and ticks. It can be a real problem because they carry so many different diseases. Have you ever been creeped out when you find a fat and gorged tick embedded in your dog's neck? Or maybe you gasp when your veterinarian tells you your precious little furball that sleeps with you has ticks. I'm going to try to educate you about fleas and ticks so it won't be such a concern if this should happen to one of your pets. It is believed that ticks have been around for literally thousands of years. They are able to survive in extremely adverse environmental conditions. Ticks transmit many diseases that are transmissible not only to animals, but also to humans as well due to their aggressive feeding techniques. They feed on mammals, birds, and even reptiles. There are believed to be over 700 species of ticks in the world. Female ticks reproduce at an astounding rate. That fat, plump, and gorged tick you find attached to your dog contains hundreds of baby ticks. When she finally drops off in your home and you don't know it, she is ready to present you and your family with hundreds of baby ticks. Isn't that a pleasant thought? Waking up at night and finding a single tick crawling on your body is enough to freak anyone out. I know that's happened to me before when I've wakened up and feel something crawling on my neck. I turn the light on and I've got a tick between my thumb and index finger. That always grosses me out and I know it's going to gross you out as well. That big tick that fell off in the house can be the culprit because she is now depositing hundreds of baby ticks in your house. The brown dog tick is one of the most common ticks. 
it is able to complete its life cycle in as little as three months. It is said that ticks feed like a chainsaw. I love that description. Their mouth parts lacerate their host skin in order to feed. And to establish a blood pool to feed on, they have an anticoagulant in their saliva that keeps the blood from clotting. The tick also has a glue-like substance in its saliva, which helps cement their mouth parts to the skin so she doesn't fall off. It's felt they have some type of anesthetic in their saliva also, and this anesthetic numbs the skin so the dog or host doesn't feel the tick feeding on it. Now the gross part. Not only does the tick suck blood from the host, they also vomit waste products, including their poop or feces, back into the host. Now you understand why ticks are difficult to remove once attached and why it takes such a long time for the skin to heal once they're removed. Because of this cement, they're firmly attached, so sometimes when you pull a tick off, the head will remain attached. I always recommend using a pair of tweezers so you can get all the way down to the skin, so when you pull it off, you make sure you get the head as well. If the head does remain attached in the skin, it can cause a severe reaction and sometimes the skin gets infected. Even if the head does not remain in the skin, the skin can become very irritated just from all the bad waste products the tick is vomiting back into the host. It is believed that a single female black-legged tick can suck up to 15 milliliters, which is one tablespoon of blood from her host. You can see why animals die from blood loss in areas with a heavy tick infestation. I have seen pictures at one of the conferences I attended where researchers were looking for ticks in Oklahoma where they had a very heavy infestation. They would drag white sheets across the ground and it would literally be covered with thousands and thousands of ticks. They showed pictures of baby deer that had died from blood loss and they had literally thousands of engorged ticks on their face their head, their neck, to the point where you couldn't even see the poor thing's eyes. I read another article where they went into an area and examined dogs to find out how many ticks they had on them. Some dogs had none, some dogs had one or two, some dogs had 10 or 15, and one poor dog had 4,700 ticks on his body. Can you imagine how bad this poor dog must have felt? Can you imagine how bad the pet owners were that owned that dog? I will mention several diseases that ticks can transmit to our pets, but we're going to focus on Lyme disease because it affects both animals and humans. Bacterial diseases that ticks can transmit are Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, ehrlichiosis, and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Now, you probably have only heard about Lyme's disease and maybe Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Some of the protozoal diseases, which I know you haven't heard of, are babesiosis and hepatozoonosis. So let's talk about Lyme disease. As you probably know, it got its name because it originated in an area of Lyme, Connecticut. Lyme disease has now spread west and south and is present in many states in the U.S. Lyme disease is caused by a bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi and is spread by a black-legged tick. The life cycle of the black-legged tick takes anywhere from two to three years Ticks need a blood meal in each life stage in order to survive. Ticks detect their host from the breath of the host, the body odor of the host, the heat from the host, moisture, vibrations, and even a shadow. They're pretty amazing. They wait for the host by resting on tips of grass and shrubs. Their front legs are stretched out, waiting for the host to walk by, and when they do, they grab a hold and crawl through the hair or through your clothing to an area where there's bare skin. They pierce the skin and they secrete the anesthetic to numb the skin. They secrete a glue to attach the head to the skin and then they begin macerating, chewing, and sawing the skin. That's what the chainsaw does. Finally, they secrete an anticoagulant and then they start feeding on either you or your pet. The larval stage of the tick feeds on the white-footed mouse and then it drops off and molts into a nymph in the fall. They remain active throughout the winter into the spring. In May, the nymph will feed on mammals or birds, including humans. The nymph is about the size of a poppy seed. Once engorged, they drop off and molt into adults. At the one conference I went to on fleas and ticks, they showed pictures of different life stages of the tick. They had some of these ticks in the nymph stage that had been placed on a poppy seed muffin. And the speaker told the audience, 
to try to pick out the nymph stage, which was the same size as a poppy seed. It was literally impossible to differentiate between the nymph and the poppy seeds. Interestingly enough, the next morning at the conference, they had a breakfast set up for everyone. They had the typical bacon, scrambled eggs, yogurt, things like that, but they also had poppy seed muffins, and I never saw anyone take one. As I said, ticks can survive the winter and become very active in February and March, and each female tick can lay up to 3,000 eggs. At the conference, they showed a video that was almost like a horror movie. It was a close-up of snow, and suddenly you could see something coming up through the snow, and it was a tick. It was breaking through the snow, and that's why it's really important to continue flea and tick control year-round because ticks can survive in the winter months as well. Now let's talk a little bit about Lyme disease in dogs. Most dogs that contact Lyme disease do not show any signs or symptoms, so you wouldn't even know if they had it. If they had a blood test done, though, they could show positive on the blood test even though they were asymptomatic. When dogs do have Lyme disease, their symptoms are usually signs of lameness, inflamed and swollen joints, and fever. There's also a condition of the kidneys where they can get infected and they can die from it. So a positive Lyme test simply means a dog has been exposed to the disease and most veterinarians only treat if a dog has symptoms. Our friends at Odor Exit have generously offered for our listeners only a bottle of their amazing odor eliminating product, Odor Exit, and an ultraviolet black light to find those pet urine stains. This is a $50 value. In my 46 years as a veterinarian, I tried many products that were supposed to eliminate pet odors, but none of them worked as well as Odor Exit. Entering to win is easy. All you have to do is like and share my Facebook page, Talking Pets with Dr. Gary Clements, with one friend. That's it. One winner will be posted monthly on my Facebook page. Good luck and thanks for sharing. So far, we've talked about ticks. We've talked about how they feed and some of the diseases they transmit. But now we're going to talk about fleas. Fleas love warm, humid temperatures and high humidity. The flea eggs hatch best if temperatures are above 70 degrees and humidity above 70%. This means in southern states, fleas can be a problem year-round. In the Midwest and northern states, fleas are more active uh, up here maybe May through October. It is important to understand the life cycle of the flea in order to provide good flea control. Some people think adult fleas can jump from one dog to another, and that's how their dogs pick up fleas. Actually, that's not what happens. You know, they feel if they go to a dog park, and they get too close to another dog, they pick up fleas, or maybe if they go on a walk in the neighborhood, that's how they pick up fleas. Adult fleas actually spend their entire life cycle on the pet, and the adult flea makes up only 5% of the total flea population. The female flea is really, she's an egg-laying machine. All she does is breeds, suck blood from the pet, and lays 20 to 40 eggs. Her little eggs are small, spherical things. They're about the size of a grain of salt, but the eggs make up 50% of the total population. As your pet moves around the house and yard, the eggs drop off in the furniture, carpeting, and yes, in your bed if your pet sleeps there. So your pets become almost like a giant salt shaker. The eggs hatch into larvae, who make up 35% of the flea population. They look like little hairy caterpillars, and one thing they don't like is light, so they will crawl away from the light. They crawl down into the carpet fibers, down into cushions, under furniture, baseboards, anything to get away from the light. They feed on organic matter and the flea poop, which contains a lot of protein from the undigested blood that the female flea feeds on. If your pet has a lot of fleas, that can mean literally thousands of flea eggs and larvae in your home. The poop from the female flea looks like little specks of pepper, and it's usually found on the skin just above the tail. So if you're looking for it, have your pet facing away from you. Uh, push the hair forward from the tail up towards the head, and when the hair goes forward, look down at the skin, and that's usually where you'll find the specks. If you find little black specks, put it on a white piece of paper and add a drop of water. If it's poop, it will turn reddish-brown from the blood. If the specks are, are organic matter, it will just float to the surface and not change any kind of color. 
We really don't have to talk much about the signs of fleas on your pet. If you've had fleas on your pet, you know what they do. The pet will scratch. They'll chew on parts of their body. Dogs will typically bite right above their tail or on the inside of their back legs, or sometimes they'll take their back leg and scratch up under their armpits. Cats tend to look right down the center of their back, but they'll also scratch around their face because fleas love to run up around the face of a cat. So far, we've talked about ticks and fleas and their life cycle, but now we're getting into the meat and potatoes. We're going to talk about how do we control fleas and ticks on your pet. I'm not going to waste a lot of time about the older treatments for fleas and ticks, but if you're old enough, you remember all the horrible things we had to do to get rid of them. In the past, we used to sponge dip on our pets, which was no fun. It stunk. We had to spray the yard. We had to flea bomb the house. There were sprays for cats, but they were pyrethrins. They only lasted a few days. And unfortunately, if you sprayed your cat with flea spray and did not end up going to the emergency room, you were quite lucky. You might have sprayed your cat one time, I guarantee you, but the next time the cat saw you come in with a flea spray, I know that cat started salivating and ran away and hid. So let's talk about ticks first. The important thing with ticks is to minimize your pet's exposure to ticks. My wife and I live in an area where there's a nature preserve behind our house. There's a lot of brush, ground cover, coyotes, and white-tailed deer, which are the host for the deer tick. During the tick season, we don't take our dogs down there because I don't want them getting covered with ticks, even though we use a wonderful monthly flea and tick pill on our pets. But I don't want to have to pick any ticks off them, and I don't want to pick ticks off myself. People living in areas with Lyme disease should consider having their dogs vaccinated every year. They initially get two vaccinations about three to four weeks apart, and then an annual booster shot. Some of the products that can be used for ticks are permethrin sprays, which work pretty well in repelling ticks, and they also repel mosquitoes. But a word of caution, if you own a cat and a dog, do not, I repeat, do not use any permethrin product on your cat because it could potentially kill your cat. Usually there's a picture of a cat's head with a red circle and a red line through it, which means don't use it on the cat. And I can't tell you how many times in practice people brought cats in that were having seizures and were dying because the husband thought, well, you know, maybe just a little bit will be okay. It won't hurt the cat. So please do not use permethrin sprays on your cat. Some of the topical products work pretty well. But the problem with the topicals, with some of the topicals, is they don't kill fleas fast enough and the fleas can still lay eggs. There is a newer flea and tick collar that's supposed to work for about eight months, but I'm not sure how quickly it will kill fleas or ticks. The newer classification of drugs that work extremely well are called isoxazolines. The names of some of these game-changing flea and tick products are Semperica, Nexgard, Brevecto, and Credelio. At a conference talking about fleas, Dr. Dryden says, modern flea control is all about preventing reproduction or breaking the life cycle at the host level. This requires residual speed of kill, meaning the fleas die before they can lay any eggs and reproduce. He says, the residual speed of kill with isoxazolines is stunning. Their ability to wipe out fleas is unlike anything we've ever seen. These products have revolutionized flea and tick control because they work so well. In one study, one of these monthly canine products was used to treat pets in a household with a severe flea infestation. The flea population was reduced by 95% after 14 days, and there were no fleas after two treatments or 60 days. These oral flea and tick pills are a whole lot easier than spraying or dipping like we had to do in the past. One popular topical product for cats actually kills fleas, ticks, ear mites, roundworms, hookworms, and prevents heartworm disease. And a recently released product for dogs kills fleas before they lay their eggs, ticks, treats for roundworms and hookworms, and prevents heartworm disease. So it's best if you discuss the different products with your own veterinarian because they will have what they feel is the best product for your pets. No matter what product you choose, you must treat every pet in the household and any outdoor pets you have. If you don't, you may never get the fleas under control. Again, one of the conferences I went to where Dr. Dryden was the speaker, and he's considered the world's authority on fleas. They send him into areas where flea products 
don't seem to be working well. The companies that produce these products pay him to go there to figure out why their products don't seem to be working. He described how he went to one household in the South where they couldn't get the fleas under control no matter what they did. They were supposed to put the topical on monthly. They were actually doing it every three weeks. So he put a motion detector camera up in the backyard. The next morning, they looked at the camera and a big fat possum would come waddling into the yard to eat the cat food that was left out on the back porch. They got a humane trap, caught the possum, and treated it for fleas, and they removed over 2,000 fleas from that one possum. Now remember, one flea can lay 20 to 40 eggs, so that possum walks across the yard, and thousands and thousands of eggs are dropping off in the environment. The flea products that people were using on their pets were working, but they could not keep up with the number of fleas in the environment because of that big fat possum. They removed the possum to an area in the country, and after that, the people were able to get the fleas under control. Did this topic get you itching and scratching? Today, we've discussed ticks and some of the diseases they can transmit to our pets and their owners, and why in the past it's been difficult to eliminate fleas on our pets in our homes. I hope I have provided the tools for you to finally prevent and treat for fleas and ticks. Now it's up to you to discuss with your veterinarian which product is best to keep your beloved pet free of flea and ticks. I'll post this podcast on my Facebook site, Talking Pets with Dr. Gary Clemens. If you have any questions about fleas and ticks that I didn't answer, post them there and I'll try to answer them. Or if you have topics for future podcasts, please post them and I will try to address them in the future. So for now, I'm Dr. Gary Clemens. Please consider adopting your next pet from a rescue group or animal shelter. Span new to your pets, and if God's willing, I'll be back soon with another podcast at Talking Pets with Dr. Gary Clemens. And for now, so long. Love your pets with all the love they deserve, and have a blessed week.